Although many people identify them as problem, there are some who argue that these firms actually operate a valid business model and that they wouldn't exist if they didn't offer a service that researchers used. This video will explore some of these arguments and address their concerns around problem publishers. Depending on where a researcher is based, they may operate under a different academic reward system and in a different publishing landscape. In some countries, academics are actually required to have a certain number of publications on their CV in order to progress in their careers, whilst in other countries, PhD students need to publish their thesis as a book as part of their requirements for graduation. In systems such as these, many argue that it's actually acceptable to pay for publication in order to meet the specified target and that the publishing process should be judged on the context it operates in rather than according to any other norms. If publishing research outputs is going to be treated as a tick box exercise, then you could argue that these firms are just fulfilling a need. Others argue that the issue of problem publishers is linked to the general over-reliance on metrics and prestige in academic publishing. For several years now, there's been a concern that the metric scores or the reputation of a particular title is actually prized more highly than the research output themselves, leading to a situation where they stand in as a surrogate for research quality. New open access publications are emerging all the time, and some researchers worry that because they've not yet had time to build up a reputation, these new journals are actually being unfairly judged next to more established titles and therefore term problematic. Many new titles actually share good quality work, and is it really fair that they should be judged on outdated standards such as metric scores? It's important to remember that researchers in some parts of the world may not have access to the same range of options when it comes to publishing their work. They may lack the support and the resources to pursue publications in recognisable big name journals, but they still face the same pressure to publish their findings as other researchers do. For some, the so-called problem publishers represent their only chance to share their work and contribute to the wider scholarly landscape. As with different publishing models, it's vital not to judge the practices of other countries on the basis of those common in places like Western Europe and the United States. Given the rationales outlined so far in this video, some people actually think that problem publishers are nothing more than a vanity press under another name. Vanity presses don't solicit content, but instead exist to publish work in return for a fee. This is an accepted publishing model and some argue that problem publishers shouldn't be treated any differently or held to any different standards. However, it's important to note that although vanity presses will publish a wide variety of content that might not find a home elsewhere, what they don't do is claim that this is peer reviewed work. And this is the vital caveat to all of the arguments outlined in this video. Although it's important to recognise cultural differences in academic and publishing cultures, the main reason that many of these publishers are considered problematic is that they misrepresent themselves by claiming to publish peer-reviewed scholarly work when in fact much of their output is anything but. They exist to make money and scam unsuspecting researchers into handing over the rights to their work. This practice undermines the integrity of all published research and all researchers should be aware of the issue so they can avoid being caught out. 